I'm out here in Utah with Jim from Dynatrek, and we're gonna take you with us as we hit the trail and talk about all things off-roading. I'm gonna ask him some of the most frequently asked questions that you ask me, and we're gonna talk about the new Ford Bronco and can it compete with the Jeep Wrangler. This is gonna be a lot of fun, a lot of good conversation. Stay tuned. Welcome to Trail Recon, I'm Brad and I'm here with Jim from Dynatrack and today we're just gonna go hit the trail and have a great conversation. We've done a few of these videos in the past and it's always just a good conversation. Jim, I know you're a busy guy, man, so thanks for coming out here today. <laughs> It's awesome. Pleasure. Looking yeah. forward to it. I mean, we're in Utah, man. What a beautiful yeah, place. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So I'm excited to ask you some good questions. I think we're going to have a good dialogue. Uh, but before we hit the trail, yeah. let's talk about what we're driving today. Okay. What did you bring with us? All right. So this is a 2018 Sahara JL. Okay. And it was intentionally built to be a fairly mild build. You okay. know, a lot of people always expect, you know, huge, you know, big builds from us. But, you know, not everybody wants that. And we have a line of products under the Enduro Sport brand that are part of Dynatrack, because uh, obviously there's a lot of customers that don't need really big hardcore things. Yeah. So this car is equipped with a Pro Rock 44 front. It's also equipped with our Enduro Sport front bumper. Okay. And it's also equipped with our Enduro Sport two inch lift nice. kit. And so the two inch lift kit was designed to be an easy installation lift kit, a great riding lift kit, and also to be a low maintenance lift kit. So we wanted to keep things like the factory control arms and rubber bushings that are quiet, dependable, and millions of miles of factory testing. Yeah. Uh, but we also wanted to have a good ride. So yeah. we chose Fox shocks to go with it. Shocks are a key part of any suspension. Uh, they add more ride quality than any other component in the suspension. Other things add, but to a lesser degree. Uh, and then the ProRock 44. You yeah. know, we all know front axles on Wranglers mm -hmm. for quite a while are always, if you will, a weak spot particularly if you're running bigger tires. Yep. This car's equipped with 35s, yep. BF Gooders 35s, which is a great size. You can go up to 37s if you have a Rubicon with a little bit tire fenders. Sure. Uh, but uh, the purpose of this was to make it easy for people to get in and out of the car, day in, day out, daily driver if you want, yeah. not to be something you gotta jump up in, jump up right. down. The wife, the kids, everybody gets in and out sure. really easy. Perfect for what we're doing here today. Yeah, Just a right. nice casual trail, a good and scenic view. So I'm ready to hop in and uh, and man, I'm gonna start picking your brain. You ready? Yeah, I'm good. Let's do it. Let's go. So Jim, I love coming out here to Utah, man. The scenery out here is amazing. The wheeling opportunity is endless. I know you've been coming out here for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Is there one like memorable, uh, off-road adventure that just stands out in your mind? Yeah, yeah, so I, I'd have to say it was really one of my very first times out here. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I, I started four-wheeling in full-size trucks. Yeah. I, I wasn't really a Jeep guy at all. That evolved, Okay. and uh, a lot of it evolved from, you know, going to Moab, which is kind of a mecca for Jeeps, right? right? Uh, but when I first started coming out here, I came out here in my 79 F250. Yeah. And uh, I had, uh, you know, 40-inch tires on it, and uh, it was big Saturday when the, all the runs are going. And the night before, I was gonna leave early Saturday morning because I knew the runs were going. There's no point in trying to hit a trail because all the good ones are gonna be busy. Yeah. Uh, but some guys came to me, hey, we got a plan. We're gonna go to Pritchett Canyon. <laughs> I didn't know what Pritchett Canyon was. <laughs> so I go, well, all right, that sounds good. Good trail. He go, oh yeah, great trail. Uh -huh. go, all right, good. Yeah. And uh, he said, we gotta get there early though because the club run's gonna go through. And if we get in early, we'll be ahead of them and not behind okay. them. Well, we got there in the morning and they and the club had guys set up not letting anybody in uh -huh. until the club run came in. Okay. And uh, I had no idea this was the hardest trail out here. Yeah. And uh, it turns out there was a, these guys had a motive for me to, to go. <laughs> and uh, there was a reason I was invited. And it wasn't just because of me, it was because mm. of the truck. Mm. Uh, so we had to wait for the club run to go through. So we're at the back of the run. And I thought this was going to be a quick run, so I didn't bring any food, water. I had nothing, yeah, you know. Yeah. I just thought it was going to be a quick, you know, trip. So long story short, after we waited for everybody to get through all these obstacles, uh, we were at Rocker Knocker, and uh, it was just taking forever. Mm -hmm. And I was starving. It was getting late, uh, and so I created a go round at Rocker Knocker that didn't exist at the time. Now it's all. It's been used and abused, and it's all tore up over that way too, so it's not much of a bypass anymore. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but at that time, because of the long wheelbase and the big tires that most of the Jeeps didn't have, yeah. uh, I was able to kind of power up this hill and get up there. And then I found out after that, when we got to the rock bot, why I was invited. 
because with the long wheelbase truck, I was the only one that could get up the rock pile to get the other cars up. <laughs> so they all knew, and this is when they broke it through. Well, Jim, this is why we brought you. Yeah. You know, we want you to go up that that hill, that that obstacle, and then you can pull one of us up. Wow. And then one, one, once one of us gets up, we can pull the next one right. up. Just daisy chain. So that was a really long day. <laughs> By the end of the day, I was beat. We didn't get out of there till like 11 p.m. Yeah. And we were at the trailhead at 6:40, 6:30 in the morning. So it was a really long day. And uh, but it was epic. I mean, it really was. Yeah. I mean, I I was like, wow, this is way more than I bargained for. But we made it with without any real uh, issues. Uh, nothing. You know, my truck was fine. Yeah. Um, and everybody had a good time. Well, so you took a Ford F250 through Pritchett Canyon. Canyon. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, Jim. Well, today we're on a pretty easy trail, uh, but there's plenty of opportunities in Moab to uh, to get, get get after it pretty hard. Yeah. Out of all the years, is there one situation where you've kind of been in which has been the hairiest for you? Well, this actually, uh, so yeah, I'll, 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 I would say the one again. This is with my truck because uh -huh. uh, those are my younger days. I was not as well prepared as I am these days. Okay. So there was lots more uh, misadventures, if you will. <laughs> okay. uh, but. Uh, some friends and I, of mine and I, we were going from Arizona up into Utah okay. on the Mormon Timber Trail, okay. and it's called the Mormon Timber Trail because you know back when the Mormons you know started building in Salt Lake, they would go send you know teams down into U into Arizona to get trees okay. to build churches yeah. and other things, and so this was a trail that they used to to bring wood back. So along the, during the day, as a easy day, the trails weren't that hard. But the, and there were some fast places and some opens openings in the canyons, and so we started for some reason. Somebody did something to cut in front of somebody else to kind of throw the dust in their face, mm -hmm. and so this turned into a competition, mm -hmm. and it got more and more aggressive as the as the day wore on. So every time there was an opportunity, somebody would try to you know you know blast past somebody yeah. else if they could. So we got to uh, I, I kind of dropped back for a reason, I, probably because I needed ten one hundred or something. And so I came up on, on around a corner, and I could see the guys ahead of me, but they were sort of pointing perpendicular to the road on the right side of the road. And I wasn't sure why they were like that, but I could see the road clean in front of me. Yeah. And I thought, well, here's my chance to get in front. So I mashed it, and uh, had a big motor in the truck, and uh, four barrels wide open, third gear, low range, so plenty of acceleration. Off I went, as soon as the, the nose, because it's a tall truck, so when the nose came up, you couldn't see anything in front of you. Well, suddenly out of nowhere, I realized there's a 10 foot, there's a washout in front of me. Turns out it was 10 foot across and 10 foot deep. And I launched that truck wide open throttle and slammed into the opposite side. And uh, I turned the steering wheel into a taco shell and my knees caved in the metal dash. That was like last of the steel trucks, so the dashboard was made of metal. And uh, just, I didn't get hurt. Uh, but a whole bunch of things that were in the back of the truck were now 30 feet out in front of the truck. Yeah. And uh, the winch bumper and the winch that stuck out about 12 inches in front of the grill was now completely behind the grill. And uh, it, it, it bent the frame. Uh, there was a lot of damage. The core support, the radiator had been completely pushed into the motor yeah. when it was running at wide open throttle. So you can imagine there's a lot of fan damage yeah. on the back side. And then the winch, of course, crushed the radiator on the front side. Sure. Uh, so it was a mess. But we did get it going, so you know we we worked on it. You yeah. know we used chains and another truck to just sort of you know pound, pound, pound to pull the core support out away uh -huh. from the motor, uh -huh. pulled the radiator out, <laughs> I started clipping cores and using needle nose pliers to roll them back wow. up the sides okay. of a sardine can All right. uh, to seal up the cores. Yeah, and uh, then we gathered what whatever radiator sealant that we had, which was only like one of those little pellet uh, little cylinders. Uh -huh. So then we, we used a whole bunch of oatmeal. So we had all kinds of oatmeal. And so we started using oatmeal as a radiator sealant. Huh. That works really good. Um, so it took a couple days of running. It would leak down. So after we got the truck running, which took you know probably a good 10 hours, we finally moved off that position, camped somewhere. And it did drain out the next morning. Obviously, I was not a happy guy. Right. I was pretty bummed out. Sure. Uh, so I was not exactly uh, enjoying myself, but uh, we were on our way out anyway. Yeah. So I decided to stay with the team. Yeah. And um, but we after we put water in it like two three times, all that stuff sealed up. Wow. It actually held water for a couple of years while it sat <laughs> at the house till I could get around to rebuilding the truck. Wow. Well, so yeah, it was a, a good lesson learned that day. For lesson sure. lesson learned. So number one, wear your seatbelt. Yeah. You know, you never really know what's going to pop up. Right. Uh, 
even if you're going slow, a lot of people say, well, I'm only going slow, but I've seen so many flops happen at three miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, you know, wearing your seatbelt, smart thing to do. The other thing is, you know, you know, we're, we're always out looking at scenery. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, don't forget, there's a trail in front of right. you. So, you know, a little too much scenery, all of a sudden a, a rock will pop up or something you just didn't see coming. Yeah. And uh, lesson learned yeah. the hard way. Okay, Jim, so I just want to ask a couple of questions that I get asked all the time. I think it'll be interesting to hear your response. I know these guys will find it interesting. Uh, the one question I get asked all the time is, should I buy a Jeep Sport or should I buy a Jeep Rubicon? Without having any background uh, about the individual, what, what would you say uh, generally? Well, the first thing I would I would tell a person to do is is, is evaluate who you think you're going to go wheeling with, right? Yeah. Because if you're if you're gonna if you're already hanging around some guys that have you know tires 37 inches and bigger and and, and tall suspensions, uh, don't buy the Rubicon yeah. because you're going to pay five or seven thousand dollars for a bunch of stuff that you're going to take out of that truck and replace. Yeah. Uh, so, but if you are really just going to use the car to you know do simple things like like this Jeep that I have right now, which was started off as a Sahara, which we built up, but to build it up costs more than just buying the Rubicon. Right. So uh, if you're going to stick with 35s and uh, trail ride, then I think definitely buy the Rubicon, especially yeah. if you're a beginner, yeah. because there's just so much well-engineered equipment in that car, and it's all well-integrated. It's serviceable at the dealer, so you just trouble shows up, drop it off, pick it up when it's ready. Yeah. That's the way to go. Super capable right out of the box. Yeah, I right, like it. Right. All right, another question I get asked all the time is somebody buys a new vehicle, a new Jeep, and they want to know what are the first upgrades, the first three upgrades they should do. Uh, what, what would you tell somebody? All right, so there's a really super stupid, simple answer. Uh -huh. Wheels, tires, and lift kits, all right. but you know what? That's just too simple. So yeah. to, honestly, I don't even think that's the first thing. Okay. Uh, I would say that the first thing is a tool kit. Mm -hmm. So if you're going out in the dirt, you know, even if you just have a simple flat tire, if you don't have good tools, and then the tools that come in the Jeep to change the tire aren't that easy to use oftentimes. So having a, a decent set of tools that will, you know, break lug nuts or to change a tire or just fix something that gets loose right. is super important. So yeah. tools, the second thing I'm gonna say is communications. Mm -hmm. So, you know, back in my early days, ham radios and things were way too expensive over the top, so you all use CBs, but they're terrible because the range is awful and the quality of communication is poor. Yeah. So these days there's just lots of good shortwave radios as well as ham radios, and uh, I put that in your car. That is a lifeline if something bad happens. Yeah. And it's also kind of when you're with a lot of people, it's like you're all riding the same car. Yeah. The conversation flows, everybody's having a good time, you know, communication between the vehicles yeah. is just, it just enhances that trip. Absolutely. Uh, the third thing is uh, good maps and GPS. Yeah. Uh, so back in the day when I was wheeling, we had AAA maps. That was the extent of our resources. And it got better with the, when the Delorme map books came out and yeah. we still use those to this day. Uh, but now there's just so many great GPS tools out there. Right. Uh, you, you, you know, it allows you to just, not waste as much time driving up the wrong road because right. you, 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 you're trying to find some mine or a campsite and uh, you, you're just wasting your time because you know GPS takes you right to it, right? Yeah. So that those are the top three. I, I think that all the rest of it, if you have a Rubicon, you can do a lot of good stuff. You already got a lot of good equipment yeah. as far as the vehicle it's capable. So now let's make the trip more pleasurable. Yeah, I like it. I like those three. I love them. All right, Jim, a uh, question I get asked uh, on a weekly basis, and I always love asking other people to find out their insight on it. Are you an automatic or are you a manual guy? So I started off as a manual guy, okay. and uh, and I swore by that. The simplicity of the, uh, the standard transmission, uh, I liked the fact that I could put it in a low gear and, and decelerate down hills mm -hmm. with the engine braking me and not having to use regular brakes. Uh, and at that time, two transmissions were still, this is talking about the 70s and 80s now, uh, we're still, you know, enough people had problems with transmissions, automatics on the trail that, and there wasn't much you could do, yeah. right? Uh, you can't jump start uh, a dead battery with an automatic tranny like you can with a stick, right? right? You just get three guys to push it down a hill, pop start it, and off you go. Uh, but clutches can, you know, are a point of failure mm -hmm. with manual transmissions, especially if they get worn out or the driver isn't a, a just abuses the clutch because he's not very good with it. Uh, and he smokes it, and then you're kind of stuck. Yeah. Uh, so I would say after 2005, I became an automatic. Okay. Guy. And uh, I'm happy with that decision. Uh, as I would say, also from 2005 manure, 
the kind of obstacles that people tend to tackle are much more severe. Mm -hmm. So having that two-footed throttle control with brake and gas is is a big benefit. Sure. And uh, not only that, but hey, it's just a lot easier. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, you don't have to shift all the time. Right. So uh, no, I think automatic these days. Yeah. Right. And the and the developments in automatics. Eight speeds, ten speeds. It's. Uh, I think it's phenomenal. Yeah. Well, the debate will go on. I'm sure. The debate will go on. Plenty of people out there. Manual, manual, sure. manual. <laughs> sure. Okay, Jim. Now, uh, a lot of people ask me all the time, "What do you prefer? You prefer a nice, easy trail? You prefer being out on the rocks? You know, w would you rather be out on Pritchett Canyon going hard, or a nice, easy, scenic drive like this? What's your? Well, um, I, it's a, I, it's, I, I like both. Yeah. And so, uh, obviously. I've had my fair share of hard rock trails, so I don't seek them out. You know, there's a period of time when we just, that's all we did, right? Yeah, Let's go yeah. play on rocks. Right. I, after a while, you, it's like, it's fun, and it sharpens your skills, mm -hmm. and you should keep up with some of it because those skills are valuable. Yeah. So even when you're doing an easy trail, you might come across a washout or a bunch of obstacles, but you want to keep going. So those skills come in handy, Absolutely. and you want to keep them going. So you always, don't, don't just get... Uh, on graded dirt roads, because you, you know anybody could, that's Cadillac road. Anybody can do that, right? right? You right. don't need a four wheel drive. Yep. Uh, but uh, what's a great trip for me is uh, a, a, over, a long trip. Mm -hmm. I like going as far as I can off road, yeah. long distances. Yeah. Uh, coming off the trail only when I gotta have fuel and yeah. I'm completely out. Um, and I like those trails to have a little bit of a mix. So I like to have an obstacle to kind of. You know, make the day a little eventful. If it's just graded roads with scenery, well, there's a lot of paved roads you can do that on. Uh, but I like being remote. I like uh, having some obstacles. So when it turns into a two track and there's mm -hmm. some washouts or some growth in the tr in the trail, you got to get out and you got to cut those trees to yeah. get through to discover what's on the other side because it has nobody's been down it in 20 years. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, you're speaking my language. Yeah. All right, Jim, one more question before we get into the Bronco, which I know these guys are excited to hear our thoughts on. But ever since I bought the Gladiator, I get asked all the time, what do I prefer, the Wrangler or the Gladiator? What should I buy, the Wrangler or the Gladiator? What are your thoughts? So, obviously, you know, I came from trucks, yep. right? And uh, when we go on long runs, I'd fill that truck. Yep. Three-quarter ton pickup, loaded. And uh, when, and that was one of the things that kept me away from buying a Jeep, uh, but now Wranglers are have a lot more storage space. Mm -hmm. Four doors are pretty great, pretty phenomenal. Yeah. The car's bigger. It's got a lot more elbow room than CJs and y, and uh, YJs did. Uh, tall guy like me fits in the car nicely. Yeah. I feel comfortable even for long trips, and I can have myself, a buddy, a dog, and all our stuff to do a six or seven day trip, and it works. Yeah. I mean, you know, I I can't bring a lot of extra stuff. And that first time I had to go from that F-250 down into a Jeep, I had a lot of stuff sitting on the driveway that I'm like, well, got to make some decisions here. <laughs> but it's not it's not that bad. You yeah. know, once, you, once you've kind of adjusted to some of the stuff you were hauling and never used, mm -hmm. uh, not having it, uh, you, you, I don't really miss it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy. Not only that, but I like everything inside the car, yeah. sealed up. Uh, if, it's, it, if the weather gets really nasty, I know my sleeping bag is still dry. And... Uh, so I, I think Wrangler. Okay, uh, that's good. All right, so now the hot topic of the day. Ford finally officially announced the, the Bronco and uh, they shown all the details and the specs and now you get a good look at it. Now that you've seen it, at least not in person, but you've seen mm -hmm. what they're offering, what do you mm -hmm. think, how do they do with the styling of it? Well, uh, I'm not, that impressed by the four door. Okay. I think a Wrangler four door looks much more appealing to me. Okay. Uh, the two door though, so you got to remember that I was wheeling back when you could, you know, back when the uh, 77 and earlier Broncos were around. Yeah. So that body style always was pretty cool for me. I always saw guys with Broncos with no doors and no top and just driving around. I think that'd be a cool rig uh, to have. So the two door Bronco, the Sasquatch model looks very impressive. Uh, uh, so I, I like that body nice, style. Nice. But the four door, eh. The, the Wrangler keeps me keeps my attention. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So the Bronco came out hard at Jeep. I mean, it, you can yeah. tell that they yeah. were definitely coming out at him. Yeah. Um, but I think they also came out at the Toyota 4Runner, which mm -hmm. is also going to be, mm -hmm. you know, probably lose a little bit of share from mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on how well they did on competing? Going to be competing with the two? Well, I, I honestly, I, I think. Um, you know the difference in chassis uh -huh. and drivetrain is is a big size. So you, I think more Toyota owners 
uh, are go are going to be an easier transition to a Bronco. Yeah. Uh, I think anybody that's had Wranglers is probably going to stick with Wranglers. Mm -hmm. There'll be people who will buy a Bronco because they just got to check it out, right? right. Uh, which is that's all fair. But but overall, you know, the Bronco is not going to be uh, as hardcore of a vehicle. So if I'm going to the Rubicon, mm -hmm. right, which you know has a lot of tough obstacles, am I going to see Broncos out there in a couple of years? Mm -hmm. Of course I am. But they're going to have a harder time. Most people are going to have to work a lot harder on a lot of those obstacles to get through because of the IFS. Yeah. So uh, personally, I think that uh, the Bronco is going to pull in more Toyota people, which makes me happy. I'm an American car guy. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pulling hard for the big three every day. <laughs> uh, so that's good. Um, I think Jeep people, uh, if somebody's had a bad experience with Jeep, well, hey, they, they're just looking for another brand. They, right. you know, it, it's not really about the car. It's about... Uh, something that happened in their history that that's going to push them that way, but uh, and I think they'll be curiosity seekers. Now, to me, the big thing I don't know is durability. Mm -hmm. Durability is to me the most important quality of any off-road vehicle. Uh, by definition, you're going somewhere where there's no service. Yeah. So how durable the Bronco is going to be is going to really be telling in terms of what customers it attracts. Because both Wranglers and uh, Toyotas are are good quality, tough yeah. vehicles. You're right. Now, was it a mistake for them to not do a front solid axle, do you think? To be a direct competitor with Jeep? I, no, I don't think so because I think they're going, you know, there's going to be more SUV owners and yeah. crossover owners that are like looking for something with more adventure. Yeah. And uh, that IFS is going to be an important feature to them because yeah. they're really driving on the street almost all the right. time. Yeah. But it's got the lockers and it still does have that sway yep. bar disconnect, which yep. is still going to make it pretty capable. Oh, yeah. So yeah. it'll be yeah. interesting. Yeah. I, I, I mean, can't wait to drive one. We see plenty of IFS vehicles on the trail, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and they're making it. You they know, are. sometimes though we watch them. You know, struggle and flop on, you know, flop around on a, on a tough obstacle, but they, they get there eventually. Yeah, IFS has come a long way. It has. It has. It has. And I think that's the key. So IFS can be uh, very durable. We make IFS for uh, defense purposes, mm -hmm. and they're very strong, very capable, but they're also very expensive. Yeah. And the factory has a, a limit of what they will spend. Uh, they also are not designing for the top two percenters, and right. so they're designing for those those other people. And so there's they have to keep the price of the truck reasonable, or they won't sell it. Right. So um, I think that's a factor. So I put my name in the hat to reserve one of the Broncos mm -hmm. because I think it's intriguing, and I yeah. think there's you know it'll be cool to take it on some adventures. But I've got some reservations, right? I, I'm buying a vehicle that I've never driven, never sat in, never touched. Yeah. Well, how do you feel about that? Well, uh, I have not ordered one yet, <laughs> uh, but since we're both in the off-road business, right. I probably will, and you probably will, because mm -hmm. it's sort of part of our job. Right. Uh, but, you know, as a consumer, uh, I think people, the interior of a vehicle, mm -hmm. the amount of technology in a vehicle, how much of that technology is easy and elegant, how much of it is kind of clunky and confusing. Uh, how do the seats feel? How much headroom do I have? How much elbow room do I have? Uh, I'm a tall guy, yeah. so these are these are things that are important to me, and I think they're important to lots of other people, but for their own reasons. So interiors are a huge part of the buying decision of a vehicle. Sure. And as an and in an off road world, let's face it, how much time do you spend inside that car? Right. A lot. Yeah. So if you're not really comfortable in it, or you just don't really like the layout, or you prefer the layout in a Wrangler versus a Bronco, or a Bronco versus a Wrangler, that's gonna be a big part of your decision as to which car you go with. Right. And uh, I think that's good because, you know, people are gonna like one or the other for different kinds of reasons. Yeah. And, and that's what's, that's why there's so many cars out there to buy. Yeah, well, hopefully I like it when I get it. <laughs> All right, Jim, I, I've owned a lot of vehicles over the years, and I know there's some that I've just built emotional attachments to, and I, I know you have had a lot of vehicles. Is there a favorite? Yeah. Bad. yeah, it's easy. So, you know, that truck, that 79 Ford, uh -huh. uh, it was, that was a big deal. When I bought that truck, that was like buying a Corvette and, and I was only like 18 years old. Oh, wow. And uh, so that was a huge financial uh, thing for me to do. And I literally had to go hungry uh, because I couldn't make the payments. $149 a month payments so, <laughs> and I, I couldn't afford it. Yeah. And so I went hungry and there were times I couldn't afford gas. So I literally had to hitchhike in the snow to oh, work and gosh. leave that truck at home. So not only that, but I just got a lot of memories yeah. and the great memories. And uh, it was the first brand new vehicle I ever bought, yeah. right? Everything else had been used before that. Uh, so I, I, to me, I'll die with it. I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll never sell it. Uh, as I told, I've crashed it, but restored it. Yeah. Uh, 
and you know even though it's it's really an old truck it's gone through a couple restorations and if it needs a couple more before i can't climb in and out of it anymore i'll do it oh, that's awesome Jim, what a great day out here on the trail hanging out with you, man. And, and I just love the stories and the conversation. Thanks for taking the time, man. I really appreciate it. No, it's been terrific. Yeah. I enjoyed the ride. We're going to do it again. We're definitely going to yeah. do it again. I, I think it'd be cool. I, I, man, I really enjoyed the, the Jeep, man. It's a great build. It rides really nice out here on the trail. So Thanks. nice job with that. Appreciate it. I hope you guys have enjoyed hanging out with us in this video. If you are not a member of E3 Overland, I'll leave a link down below. Go check it out. We would love to have you as a member. And if you are visiting Trail Recon for the first time, hit that subscribe button. I'd love to have you as a member the Trail Recon team. Thanks for watching.